Let's construct meaning for acceleration and velocity problems. Uh, the second half of chapter eight, it is worth it for us to help ourselves construct the meaning to make connections with old things, to introduce things in a way that we can grab onto them because then it makes it easier for us to understand the concept. Less problems to really grasp it and we walk away with a, with a much better understanding of what's going on. We don't get lost in the process. So here we go. Let's take a look at, uh, let's suppose we're going to launch an animal off a cliff, perhaps Fluffy the cat. There's Fluffy. And we have this mechanism up on the cliff that's going to allow us to launch the cat in the air. I don't know, let's call it a catapult. Thank you very much. So we're going to launch Fluffy. <laughs> Fluffy's going up in the air. And then it reaches a high point and then splash into the water. <laughs> let's make it more interesting. Let's put a shark in it. But anyways, so here's the deal. What I want to describe for you is kind of the mathematical equivalent of uh, cliff notes in language arts. But anyways, here's the deal. Basically, Cluff, Fluffy has two forces working for her. Let's suppose we've launched her upward with an initial velocity of 64 feet per second, but anywhere here on the planet, we have a gravitational pull that any object up in the air is going to tend to be pulled back towards the Earth at a rate of 16 feet per second squared. So that's the gravitational pull. Some people say there is no gravity and the Earth sucks. I don't know. But anyway, so here's the deal. What you want to understand, using these, these are vectors. When you get to physics, if you haven't already, you're going to see that we represent forces with vectors. We're talking about the direct upward vertical force and then the direct downward force of gravity. Now we could launch Fluffy at more of an angle then there'd be two forces of initial uh, launch. There'd be how far did we kind of uh, push her in the horizontal direction and how far in the vertical. When it comes to these upward projectile problems, all we're dealing with, you guys, is the upward force, the straight up and down vertical force, and then the force of gravity. So keep that in mind. She's going up, she's coming down. All right, now, this is cool. If you can wrap your brains around this, then a lot of things are going to start to make sense. Let's look at the distance traveled due to gravitational force. We're going to say that this function, gravity is a function of time, this is the distance that an object will have fallen um, over the course of time. So the distance fallen uh, as a result of gravity, that distance, it's going to drop 16 feet downward times the number of seconds it's been traveling squared. So at time zero, if you hold something steady and then you drop it, I don't know, maybe it's a hint. Let's drop a hint, I don't know. But we're gonna drop it. At time zero, it hasn't dropped at all. But after one second, it has fallen 16 feet. Now gravity is gonna make that speed, that velocity, I should say, uh, uh, pick up. It's, like, it's gonna go faster, its speed is gonna increase. We'll talk more about um, the terminology later. But so check this out. After two seconds, uh, if you put a two in here, then that object has fallen 16 feet times four, so it's dropped 64 feet. After three seconds, negative 16 times three squared, it's dropped 144 feet and so on. So this function is how far it's dropping. What's the distance dropped after t seconds? Well now, let's do a little calculus. If we take the first derivative of this function, which is giving us distance, there's our first derivative right there. All right, you guys, that's velocity. That's how fast the object is dropping. So at time zero, the velocity is zero. It's not dropping with any speed at all. After one second, now it's up to a velocity of dropping 32 feet per second. But gravity's cruel. It pulls it faster and faster. So after two seconds, the velocity is 64 feet per second. After three seconds, that baby's really hauling. Now it's dropping at a rate of 96 feet per second. After four seconds, it's dropping 128. So if you drop out of an airplane without a parachute, you just keep dropping at a faster and faster velocity until you reach terminal velocity, which must mean you always land in an airport. <laughs> I don't know, okay? Or at least in a hangar at an airport, which Kind of makes sense because it's like, oh, this would be a cliffhanger. I don't know, whatever. But anyways, here's the deal. So that's the distance. This is the velocity. Whoa, 
wait a minute. Let's take the derivative of the first derivative. If you take the first derivative of the first derivative, I believe that's known as the second derivative. Look at that. The second derivative is a constant, negative 32. Huh. Whoa. Didn't we say the other day in our notes that the second derivative is the rate of change of the rate of change? Looky here. What's happening to velocity over time? Every second that goes by, the velocity keeps getting negative 32 feet per second more. So the second derivative is describing the rate of change of the first derivative. The first derivative is describing the rate of change of the function. Every second that goes by, how, uh, what's the velocity now of this, uh, of this object? So again, second derivative is the rate of change of the rate of change. That is acceleration, that it's going 32 feet per second faster and faster as it drops. That's acceleration. This is the velocity that in every, any one moment in time, we can say, hey, the velocity is now negative 32 feet times however many seconds it's been since you dropped the object. Now, here's another thing that's kind of cool if you want to hook this up. After one second, the object drops 16 feet. Now, think about this. At time zero, the velocity was zero. It wasn't going with any velocity at all. At one second, it had now sped up so that at one second, it's dropping at 32 feet per second. So what was the average velocity over the course of the first second? Well, if you average zero with negative 32, it averages out to be that in that course of the first second, on average, it was dropping with the velocity of negative 16 feet per second. So the mean velocities, you get more into calculus, you'll be dealing with this more, but the mean velocity is that you're dropping 16 feet in the first second. Oh, we dropped 16 feet in the first second. Now check this out. At one second, the rate of speed at which we're dropping is 32 feet per second. Between one second and two seconds, that velocity keeps speeding up. By the time you get to two seconds, the velocity is now negative 64 feet per second. What's the average velocity in that one second interval? When we started out at one second dropping that fast, and at the two second mark, we were now dropping at that rate. Well, the average, if you add those two up and divide it by two, the mean velocity of the second second that the object was dropping is 48 seconds. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we average 16 feet per second in the first second and 48 feet per second during the second second, didn't that mean that we dropped, oh, 16 plus 48, 64 feet by the time we hit the second second? And you can see that all the rest of it works out too. The average velocity from the second to the third second of time was 80 feet per second. Losing 80 feet per second, add them up and divide by two. Well now what? If we average that many feet per second between the second and third second, let's add 80 to this amount. Sure enough, we've fallen 144 feet at right by the time we get to the third second. So if you can look at this and put all this together, it gives you a better feel for what's going on. You might come back and look at this part of the video in the future, but this is distance fallen. This is the rate at which we're falling. The first derivative is a rate of change. In this practical application, it is velocity. The second derivative is concavity. That rate of change, we're actually going faster in the negative direction. We're getting bigger negatives. So this is how the rate of change is changing. It's the rate of change, the rate of change. Anyways, that's cool. Keep, uh, keep an eye out for that. So if we think about Fluffy, where are you, Fluffy? If we think about Fluffy going, woohoo, and then coming back down, there's two things at work, the upward velocity and the downward velocity. So we get this formula right here. What happens is the height after t seconds, if you start at a height of s, so this would be S right here, from the big blue up to the top of the cliff where uh, Fluffy was launched. Fluffy's going upward with an initial velocity of 64 feet per second. That's going to go here. Now, meanwhile, gravity is doing its thing. It's pulling the, uh, this object down at this rate right here. Now, initially, Fluffy is going to be going upward because of the upward velocity. 
but after not too long, gravity's going to win out, it's going to stop, and it's going to come back down. Now, if we really think about calculus and the first derivative being the rate of change, if you look at this one term, this quadratic term, which describes the action, the force of gravity, the second term, the linear term, is describing the force of the initial upward velocity. Let's look at this gravitational force right here. If we look at the, um, at, uh, the first derivative, it's negative 32t. So after two seconds, the velocity is going to be negative 32 times 2. It's going to be negative 64 feet. Meanwhile, the upward velocity, if there were no gravity, would stay at 64 feet. So hopefully you agree that at two seconds, at the two second mark, this upward velocity is 64 feet, but we can tell by the first derivative, the first derivative being negative 32t, that after two seconds, the upward velocity, or the downward velocity is gonna be 64 feet per second. It's at the two second mark that the upward velocity and the force of gravity negate each other. That must be when Fluffy stops and comes back down. So we'll see that indeed that's, that's the case later. All right, let's look at a new example, because this is uh, a couple sections in chapter eight and vi very common problems. You've seen this in algebra two, very common in, in calculus. And here's perhaps, oh no, never mind. sorry, I wanna make one more point. Yeah, this is actually very important. No matter how we launch Fluffy, if it's more at an angle or straight up and down, and clearly those two reach the same height, that's supposed to be the way that is, they reach the same height. No matter which direction we launch, how steep or shallow, it's only the upward velocity that we're dealing with. So please, when you see parabolas of the, the um, height after so many seconds, it is not the path that Fluffy traveled. Fluffy, unfortunately, could have gone whoop, whoop. Okay, now that makes the problem harder because she didn't hit the water, sorry. But it doesn't matter what angle you're launching her at. When you see a graph, when you see a graph, and on the x-axis, it's not distance traveled that way. The x-axis is going to be time. After so many seconds, how far up is fluffy? So what you're going to see is that at two seconds, she hits like her max point from here. She's starting here at time zero. She's going to go up to her max point, and then she's going to come back down. So the graph you're going to see, and this isn't been, this is this is actually a parabola, so this, this should not have a curve to it. It should look more. I mean, it shouldn't bend back this way. But so your uh, graph is going to be the height, the height after t seconds, as a function of time. So when you see that graph, don't try to make this the distance out over the ocean, and then the height that she traveled. It's time. So. Whether it was this pink one, if it's this pink one, look, uh, it's going up to the top and then it's coming down and hitting the water at a certain amount of time. Or if it's this one, same graph, she's going up and then highest point and then down to hit the water. So it's just, it's time on the x-axis and it's height on the y-axis. So that's pretty important to keep, keep that straight. All right, so here's probably the most classic calculus problem, the, the um, uh, what do we call it, an object traveling on a, on a line. So, uh, so here it is, check this out. Let's suppose we want to track the velocity of a snail on meth. Oh, that's not what you think, okay? This car is meth, all right? That's, that's the name of the car. And if you look, there's a little snail on it, okay? Now, never mind that the owner of the call, car's name is Crystal. That's a, that's a whole different deal. But anyway, so here's the thing. Let's suppose this is the start, this is uh, zero feet, and we're gonna speed up, make it to 300 feet, and then come back in reverse. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna say, on your mark, it's set, go. The car is gonna speed up, start going real fast, and then it's gonna slow down and come to a stop, and then it's gonna turn around and come back faster and faster and faster as it comes back this way. So what we're going to do is we're gonna model the distance traveled over the course of time. So the graph is going to look like this. Over the course of time, uh, where is this snail in relationship to the starting point from zero to 300 feet? 
So you guys, this y-axis is this guy tipped upward. We want to know how far is it going up and back in, in, uh, to the 300 feet. So you need to try to orient the graph that way. This is the distance. We usually use S of T in math. I don't know why, I can never remember. I'm sure it's got Latin origins. But maybe that's why it makes all the sense in the world to pick a snail. It's the distance of the snail after T seconds. Okay, so anyways, um, this, uh, this function then would be where is the snail after a certain portion of time. Remember how the snail sped up? Then it slowed down and came to a stop where it was at the 300 foot mark? That equates to our little snail on Crystal's math right here going faster and faster and then slowing down and getting there and then coming back at a faster and faster rate. Tip that up this way and over the course of time, the x-axis is time, this is the function you get. Stopped, going faster and faster, so it's accelerating, accelerating upward, then it's stopping and coming back down. Uh, now honestly, this function looks like it might be cubic. Uh, do you see how it's bending upward? There's a point of inflection, it's coming back down, so this S of T function might very well be part of a function that looks like this. But it's only in that first quadrant, uh, feasible region, where we really want to discuss the, uh, the car and where it's going. Uh, oh, and by the way, so this means now that S of T is distance. How far is it away from that starting point? It gets 300 feet away, right, height of 300, then it comes back to zero, it's back to the starting point. Original function is distance. Now the first derivative is velocity, and we can write it as V of T. And the second derivative is acceleration, that's A of T. So if we go back to this bigger graph right here, a uh, couple things then. If, uh, if we have acceleration, do you agree this is concave up? This car is accelerating until it gets to some inflection point somewhere in here. I don't know, maybe somewhere about, uh, uh, maybe up about here somewhere, I don't know. It, no, probably back in here, okay, whatever. Okay, so maybe it's in there. It goes from concave up to concave down. All right, and then uh, velocity, and here, here's something else we really need to discuss. Those of you that have heard this in, in physics or physical science class, you have an advantage. Velocity, direction matters. So do you agree when we're going uh, towards the 300 feet that our velocity is positive? We're going towards the object. But once we get to the object and we start coming back to the starting point, that is negative velocity. We're, we're actually coming back away from the object. So with velocity, direction matters. If we have a positive velocity, that's, uh, that means we're going towards the 300 foot mark. Negative velocity, we're coming away. And that's why if you think about it, these tangent lines, these tangent lines are going to be positive in here until you get to the max, and then the tangent line is the slope of zero, then all the tangents are negative, which means the velocity, the first derivative, is negative. We're coming back towards the thing. Again, remember, focus on this. The car was going towards the 300, then coming back. So this would be positive velocity, but when it goes backward, it's negative velocity. But we're tipping this up on its side to make it the y-axis. So positive velocity until we get to the 300 foot mark, then the car is going backwards, so negative velocity. Now speed doesn't matter, direction doesn't matter, nothing but raw bad blank speed, okay? And that's the deal. So basically, if velocity, the direction matters, then speed is just the absolute value of velocity. Like we might be going 20 feet per second here, and over here we might be going 20 feet per second in the other direction. This would be a positive 20 feet per second, that would be a negative 20 feet per second if it's just velocity. But if it's speed, we don't care which direction we're heading, we just say, hey, we're traveling at 20 feet per second. Trust me, this is going to become important. When you start reading the answers in the, in the workbook, you're going to need to keep that in mind, otherwise you're going to get confused. And why not understand it? Because this is actually cool applied stuff. So, positive velocity of 20 feet per second is going in the opposite direction from a negative velocity of negative 20 feet per second. But as far as speeds go, at both moments in time, the car would be going at the same speed. So speed doesn't really uh, matter as far as what the direction is. Now, the thing you're going to see in the, um, 
in the homework and in the world of calculus. We need to understand positive velocity, negative velocity, positive acceleration, negative acceleration. And so, uh, so here it is. What we get is, if you notice this part of the graph here, it's curved upward. Again, all the tangent lines are positive, meaning in this region until we get to this, uh, this point right here, this inflection point. Maybe this inflection point is at like three seconds or something like that. So right now, uh, for this interval down here, the velocity of t is greater than zero, and the acceleration of t is greater than zero. So in both cases, uh, the acceleration and the velocity are both positive. So that means we're going in a positive direction and we're speeding up. Now, check this out. What happens at this point of inflection? The velocity is still positive, but the acceleration is decreasing. We're slowing down. That's equivalent to, in this region in here, this car, uh, it was going faster, it was speeding up, but now it's starting to slow down until it comes to a stop, and then it's going to go backwards faster and faster, which is that part of the graph over there. So, once you get here, until you get to the max point, which might be, let's say, at, uh, I don't know, at, at five seconds or something like that. At the max point in this interval right here, the velocity is still positive. So uh, the, the tangent line still has a slope that's positive. So it's still going in the positive direction towards that 300 foot mark. But the acceleration is now less than zero. The car is slowing down. So the acceleration and the velocity do not have the same sign. That means the car is not speeding up. The car is slowing down. Because speed, remember, doesn't care about direction, so the car is slowing down. Now, once you get to the max, and over here, now notice there's no point of inflection over here, because the car is just going faster and faster, and crash into a wall or whatever. Remember, it's part of a cubic function likely, so there is only one point of inflection here where it's going from speeding up to, um, to changing, to having a negative acceleration. All right, There's only one inflection point, but now here's what's weird. From five and beyond, now the car made it to its max point, now it's going in reverse, but it's going faster and faster. So after the fifth second, after we made it to the critical point, in that interval from 5 to infinity, the velocity is now less than zero, it's negative, and the acceleration is also less than zero. What that means is the car is going in the direction, in the negative direction, it's going faster and faster in the negative direction. So it's re reaching greater negative velocities, like negative 32 feet per second or something like that. But what we say is, when the velocity and the acceleration have the same sign, it means the car is speeding up. Speed doesn't care whether you're going forward or backwards. It's speeding up. So here's the deal. In this first interval, the acceleration and velocity share the same sign. The car is going in a positive direction and it's speeding and, and the acceleration is, is positive. This car then in here is speeding up going towards that 300 foot mark. But at the point of inflection, even though the velocity is still positive, the car is still moving in a forward direction, um, the car is slowing down because the acceleration has the opposite sign. It's wanting to slow down and go in a negative direction. Now once we get past the max, now over in this interval, past five, now the velocity of the car is going backwards and it's going faster and faster in that direction, in the negative direction, because the acceleration is negative. So whenever you have an interval along the x-axis, and usually it's in terms of time, t, but when velocity and acceleration share the same side, the, the object is speeding up. They share the same sign, I said side, but when they share the same sign, both negative, speeding up in a negative direction, they both share a positive sign, we're speeding up in the positive direction. But in this interval here, even though we have positive velocity, we're slowing down because the, acceler the acceleration is now negative. The car wants to turn and go in the negative direction. 
So those are some big ideas. Those are going to help you throughout this chapter, and it's worth it, I think, for you to take a look at that. I don't know if there's anything else to share. I don't think so. That's about it. So anyway, good luck in the rest of Chapter 8.